Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the Electrium Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. On today's episode we're going to talk about publications in our industry and I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Bowler from Professional Electrician. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad at all, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Uh, good journey up on this crisp February morning. <laughs> yeah, it was all right, mate. Yeah. It was uh, fraught with the normal problems that you get from coming uh, from down south up to the Midlands. Uh, sticky M42, M6 as well for part of it. But uh, yeah, no, it was all right, thank you, for a, for a Wednesday morning. So... Uh, do you class uh, the Midlands still as the north? I do, unfortunately, yep. yeah. Because I've ever seen so anything, uh, anything north of kind of Newport Pagnell, we class as the north uh, from where I am, based in Buckinghamshire uh, and, and Watford Way with the company as well. So yeah, we do class you as northerners up in this neck of the woods. Yeah, I think I, we're in the position being the Midlands where we're literally so we're in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we've, that's got, right. we've got a very distinct south-north yeah, divide yeah. there. Um, thanks for joining us, Richard. Yeah. We're going to talk about. Um, professional electrician and publications and how in our industry trade publications are put together and, uh, and what it's like working at a publication. Sure. Uh, first question, the icebreaker question, we always try and mix it up every single week. So the first question for you is sources, your, tart- uh, your, your ketchups, your barbecues, your <laughs> mayos, where are you pushing them? Are they going in the cupboard or the fridge? Uh, a combination of both actually and okay. that's dictated by the better half who's a little <laughs> bit better around the kitchen okay. than I am. So I'm under instruction that the salad cream and the mayonnaise stays in the fridge. Yeah, uh, and then mustard, uh, ketchup, etc. Barbecue sauce goes in the cupboard. Okay, um, yeah, no, that's, so, that's a sound reasoning. Yeah. That is, yeah, sound so, reasoning. So, yeah, um, so yeah, uh, you know, obviously, um, we have a few other jazzy things as well that we like to that we like to include with meal times as well. Some okay. of them go in the freezer. Uh, some of them go in the fridge. Some of them go in the cupboard. So, but yeah, what what do you do? Um, I'm more fridge. Okay, oh, yeah, for everything. Oh, yeah, I think, you know, put them in the cupboard for... No, I think Maya has to go in the fridge today. Yeah. I agree with that. But what are these other jazzy things then? Um, Before we get into yeah, no, I like a little bit of a Jack Daniels. So a lot of, uh, okay. We're a big fan of Jack Daniels yeah. sauce, actually, yeah, yeah. which we get a TG if you've ever been to TGI's. Obviously, yeah, it shows yeah, you yeah. the class of establishment that I dine out at. But... Um, uh, yeah, no, Fridays, there's, there's, yeah, no, yeah, no, no. I love a bit of TGI. Everyone loves a bit of TGI's, don't they? To be fair, so. Um, but no, I mean, we have um, your garlic mayo and all sorts of. There's all sorts of different weird and wonderful nice. things that have appeared in our fridge over a Very period nice. of time. So. Um, and but, this is a question I always ask as well. Eggs. Yeah. Where do you put the eggs? Uh, the eggs go in a cupboard as well. So ah, yes, they do. Okay. Yeah, they don't okay. go. Well, again, what's the uh, well, what's your is, preference at home? Well, this is the long-standing argument I have with people on this. Now, I usually put them in the fridge. Yeah. Okay. If you go to a shop, yes, they're not in the fridge no. fridge section, are no, they? No, they're not. No. And I was, when no. I was a kid, my mum used to put them in like a little um, kind of um, porcelain egg. That's why um, we hen thing yeah. as well. Yeah. So where's the transition come to a fridge? Yeah, I don't really know. I think generally, kind of maybe the perceived <laughs> wisdom from everyone that you're supposed <laughs> to keep things in the fridge. I don't, I, again, I don't really know what it does to the shelf life of an egg if you keep it in the fridge as opposed to a cupboard. I but we definitely keep it in the cupboard. Okay. Uh, or keep them in the cupboard. Okay. Uh, as I found out to my cost the other day when they fell out and exploded. Everywhere, ah, right. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, we've had all that. Let's go on yeah, to the serious. Good. Let's yeah. go on to the serious stuff now. Um, let's, you're, you're the editor of Professional Electrician. Um, tell us how you got into the industry. Did you were you part of the trade before, or had no. you come to it kind of clean, as it were? Yeah, no, came to it clean. So if I give you a little bit of uh, background, uh, which might be useful to understand yeah, yeah. That, how I got into this, this side of things, and obviously to the readers especially, um, someone that's writing a magazine that yeah. hasn't been qualified or necessarily trained as an electrician. Um, so yeah, no, on finishing school, I did my A levels. A uh, lot, like most people that kind of age didn't really know what I wanted to do with my career I always had a passion for English and writing um, but decided to take a job after finishing school which was working as a computer programmer okay, for a yeah. year um, and no offence to anyone that's ever kind of uh, been involved in that industry but it, 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 I found quite soon found out it wasn't for me really um, quite mind numbing yeah, to be honest okay. um, so at that point there weren't a huge amount of uh, universities around the country that were doing anything really media related or journalism degrees or anything like that this was in the early 2000s so right. I'm sort of giving me age away a little bit here um, but managed to find a, a course that they were doing at Southampton Solent University as it is now but it was called the Institute at the time um, and decided to to go for it and try and get a, a journalism degree and see if that was a pathway that I would find uh, mm. interesting something that I'd want to do for a career. Yeah. Um, so yeah, after my three year period, 
um, working down there where you get to learn a broad array of uh, elements that make up the kind of life of a journalist to feature writing commissioning uh, digital which yeah. was on the horizon at the time and we were just starting to do stuff about new media yeah. uh, so I did a pathway in new media which was looking at websites and digital concepts mm-hmm. which you know in terms of media weren't weren't anywhere near mm. as uh, strong and uh, oh, yeah, not prevalent as, back yeah, in those not, days yeah not it is now yeah um, and then yeah um, upon sort of uh, having finished my dissertation and, and waiting for my results uh, I then started to look about for opportunities for work uh, closer to home uh, which I live in Buckinghamshire and I replied to an advert that I saw in The Guardian, a small advert from a, a trade publishing company, which I didn't know an awful lot about. Again, okay. you know, just to give some insight into it, really, certainly when I went and did my degree, we were more uh, focused on newspapers, the tabloid yeah. press. We didn't really know an awful lot about what a trade publication mm. might be. Consumer publications, we were very aware of, and we would write features and styles and things like that for those types of things. But trade, B2B, I'd never heard of before. It's one of those where, if, unless you're <coughs> in a trade industry, yeah. you may not necessarily know there was actually such a thing as a trade Absolutely. publication. And then if you go to any trade, really, uh, they all have trade publications yeah. that serve them. So there's some weird and wonderful publications <laughs> out there if yeah, you look yeah, around. Yeah. Uh, you know, We often have discussions in the office between myself and the other journalists about some of the weird and wonderful titles uh, that we all might like to work uh, work on one day. Biscuit World, apparently there's a... Who wouldn't? Uh, there's a title Who for wouldn't? the biscuit industry, a product <laughs> tester for Business World would be absolutely perfect. Uh, for Biscuit World would be perfect. Um, so yeah, the more you, you sort of dig deep into it, there are there are publications that serve all of these trades. So, um, so yeah, uh, you know, in answer to the original question, answered that advert, then got an opportunity to go in and, and do an interview, went in, found out that it was PE, uh, so they were looking for an editorial assistant, which is an entry-level position that you mm. come in as a journalist um, at Hamerville Media Group, which is the company yep. that, that owns PE, and we'll go on to a little bit of that a little bit later. Um, when oh no, okay, I wanted to be a sports journalist, I wanted to be a football writer, I don't (laughs) think this is quite the thing for me, but you know what, it's a great opportunity to get some work experience, probably had the intention in my own head of staying for about a year, Um, came in the door, started working on PE, and I've been at the company for 17 years since. Oh wow, okay. So so yeah, so that's how it all really started, and um, you know, I can go a little bit more into the process. Yeah, I was going to say, how how did did PE start then? What is the history of PE? The the history of PE, I think you need to get an understanding of the history of Hamerville media group mm. so the publishing house so, they, so their expertise is in trade publishing and producing primarily print publications for different trades as we've just explained so the the founding title that the group actually bought out um, was professional builder magazine which some of our some of the guys listening to this podcast might be aware of especially if they go into a builder's merchant you'll see it on the counter of every of every merchant but the 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 owner of the company uh, the publisher brian shannon um Realised there was a gap in the market for an informative, um, you know, uh, resource for mm. for builders yeah. um, at the time. Now, one of the great things that Brian managed to do when he decided that he was going to launch a magazine was also to court the leading builders merchants around the country to uh, get permission for the product to be distributed through their trade counter. Um, that is a massive, massive thing for mm. all of our publications. So, so throughout all of the publications that we have at Hamerville Media Group, which serve a number of different trade industries, a lot of them are available on the trade counter, the wholesale trade counter mm. of the industries they serve in, which is a tremendous distribution point for yep. us. Um, so that was the model. Create a magazine with an editor working on it, a sales team. Uh, they originally started out above a small shop. Um, now we're in a, you know, a bigger commercial building because yep. we have more titles and more staff. Uh, and it gradually built from that. So, so obviously, once professional builders' uh, popularity started to grow, Brian's idea and the company's idea was we can roll this out into other sectors. So, professional electrician was the second one that came out um, in 1984. So, it was our 35th birthday last year, uh, 36 years old this year, uh, and that's where it started from. So, again, the original concept of the, of the publication was to produce something for electricians and electrical contractors yep. on a monthly basis that could inform. Uh, and educate them really about what was going on in the market. It could be an independent source as well, which yeah. is massively important for these guys. So, so yeah, we managed to get the same distribution model in place as Professional Builder, which is which is a really big thing for us. So you'll see the magazine available through, you know, over two thousand trade counter outlets yeah. around the country, and uh, and yeah, and that's where, where where PE started really. So, so what what insight can you give us in terms of how that monthly issue is put together? So, how is yeah. is the process of getting all the stories together? Are there, are there any kind of particular stories and things you're looking for when yeah. you're putting these magazines together? What 
give us if, if you what, with what you can what kind of process you, the bank yeah. goes through. Well, if you could put yourself into the mindset of like myself or anyone else out there that's that's working as a journalist and trying to create a publication, whether it's for trade trade professionals or a consumer publication or anything like that, the one thing that you kind of have is a blank canvas at the start of every issue, <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. So, um, you know, I'll get, again, I'll talk about some of the nuances involved in how we put together issues and the sizes of issues and things like that, because that obviously dictates, um, you know, what we're going to put in on a monthly basis. But normally, uh, at the beginning of the year, we'll have a good idea of some themes that we want to include in the publication throughout the mm. year. Um, and then on a monthly basis, so again, if you, if you look at uh, you know, an average copy of the magazine, we split up into four sections, really, and yeah. that's what we call our regulars. So when I put together, I have a spreadsheet, which is what I call an edit list, mm. and essentially I fill that out. So once we've closed an issue and I close March's issue, so this gives, again, some of the readers a bit of an idea about how far ahead we yeah. work, okay. ahead of the publishing date. So I've actually got a copy of March's issue ah, in my okay. bag to present okay. to you, David, after we ah. finish the podcast. We're not even sort of close to being in March yet, but the mag- printed yeah. magazine's back with us. It's going to go out for distribution next week. So we work a long way ahead of ourselves in terms of the lead times. Um, and that can create some challenges because obviously you want the stories that you're covering in the publication yeah. to be as instantaneous and relevant as possible. Yes. Uh, you do have some challenges, particularly with news content in the magazine mm. on that front. But to, you know, to answer your question uh, a little bit more simply, yeah, we do sit down at the beginning of a month. We work out some themes that we mm. want in the publication. There's a lot of stuff. There's n- the one thing I'll always say about this industry, there's always things to talk about and things going on. Yeah. And, and, and probably the biggest challenge that I face on a monthly basis is the amount of editorial space that I actually have to work with. Okay. There's so many things that I want to talk about mm. and we want to talk about in the publication and to educate readers and you know stimulate some debate. And that's probably... Probably the one kind of issue that we do have is okay. that we just don't I don't have a, a, an infinite amount of space to, yeah. to, to produce this content. So, so yeah, that dictates it. But, but pretty much at the beginning of a month, my spreadsheet or my regulars that go into the magazine probably fill about half of the content in the mm. magazine. Okay. So that's pretty much already done. Uh, we're getting contributed press releases about new products and yep. news and that kind of stuff coming through to us. And then, you know, we will look at the things that, are, you know, that, that we really want to cover in that particular issue. And um, we may have talked to some t- t- suppliers like yourselves yep. where you've, 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 you've expressed an interest in maybe collaborating on an article or producing an article for the magazine based yep. on, on some interesting things that you've discovered over mm-hmm. the last little while. So, yeah, it's a movable feast. But I, I, the one thing I would say is, you know, we have the flexibility, which is the beauty of it. When you work on a monthly publication mm-hmm. as well, um, you do have enough time to chop and change the type of content you yeah. want to go. And sometimes I'll sit there and go, okay, I'm going to take that one out of this particular issue. I'm going to mm. run that article in the next issue of the magazine. Yeah. It's something more important I want to put in. Is that then the challenge of if, <laughs> if you are working ahead? Because obviously you have to work ahead to make to, to, to do the magazine. But is that the challenge of making sure that if you do, if you've got a story in the magazine that's not going to be in two months' time? Yeah, making sure that's somehow still fresh. Absolutely, because yeah. you know the industry can change, yeah. opinion can change, yeah. and then by that point, it it's might the be problem I have the thought sometimes. around that topic might have completely yeah. changed. Well, I'll go on to some of the the, the uh, benefits that digital platforms yeah. have brought to us, but in particular, that's one of them. Um, so, again, it's the editors. It, it's the real challenge for the editor is obviously I want to get as much relevant content into the publication yeah. as possible now, so that it's not out of date. And especially if we've got some really good content that's going to you know um, you know be of interest to readers we mm. hope my, my, my view of it is I want that in the next issue of the magazine and if something else has to make way for it then it has to make way for it so there is a time specific element to it yep. you do have to keep an eye on the fact that that piece of news or, or, or whatever might be out of date by the time the publication mm. comes out so that will also influence some of the the decisions behind what we decide to use as content in the magazine and what are the kind of big trends that uh, readers uh, that you find are looking to talk about and would looking to find about what kind of stories yeah. you, is there any, any particular you're trying to search out for there's an awful lot actually to be honest and again that, that creates some of the challenges is what do you focus your time on and, mm. uh, 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 and what's the most relevant thing to produce in, in the next issue of the magazine or a forthcoming issue of the magazine I, I, look, the, the major barometer for us in terms of content and, and what shapes it is that we do a reader survey on an annual basis mm. so uh, thanks to everyone if anyone's listening to the podcast today thank you for, for filling that out and helping us out because it is my main barometer for how I decide to shape mm. the content into the magazine for the following year so on that survey um, there will be things about the type of content that people find interesting what sections of the la- mag they, they, they enjoy the most things that they would like to see us doing in the future subject mm. topics uh, so we had a couple of quite interesting open ended questions which I keep for my own internal eyes only uh, one about things that people liked in the publication or yeah. like in the publication. Yeah. Uh, another about things they don't like or things that we can improve or things that we should be looking mm. to. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, that is the best 
type of feedback that I could possibly so I, I, you know in terms of shaping some of the ideas and content that I've got going into the magazine this year a lot of the feedback we received through that survey uh, has, has helped me to do that <clears throat> one of the key things that we know from our readers and obviously you know hopefully something that you you know you guys are, are doing an awful lot of good work and other suppliers in the industry as well in terms of sort of technical podcasts and a lot mm. of the content you put now technical information yeah. is the main thing that guys want um, when I first started on the mag came back onto the magazine so just important to actually understand the cycle of me co- moving off the publication and coming back on I actually left PE after being an editorial assistant about three years into that process okay. to get an internal promotion uh, at the company and become an editor on yeah. a different magazine for the trades and then eventually came back onto the publication mm. three years ago as the editor so yeah. as, the ma- as the man in charge and um, one of the most useful things because the industry had changed an enormous amount and I hadn't obviously you know I was, I was full on uh, concentrating on the titles that I was working yeah. on during one, one, I spent 10 years on a title for motor mechanics for example for independent motor okay. mechanics yeah. um, a lot of parallels with that industry and the electrical industry mm. which I found out um, you know having worked on that for such a long time and then moved over um, and when I came back onto the publication I have to say it was a bit of a culture shock because the brands that I was familiar with at the time some of them weren't around uh, when I first started on the publication. Uh, some have been, uh, there's been a lot of acquisitions mm-hmm. in the market yeah. over a, a, you know, a 10, 15 year period. Part P had just been introduced when I first started working on PE and it was something that we were challenging and debating with the readers. And it's still one of the main, to- I still yeah. find it incredible that it's one of the main topics of conversation coming back onto the publication today. Um, so, so that was one of the key things. But one of, one of the things when I first came in is my predecessor on the publication had done this reader survey and one of the key things I wanted to do in terms of putting my own mark or or changing some of the things we were doing in the publication was to look at the feedback we got on that and and what we could see three years ago is that the guys wanted more technical content in the magazine so we made a conscious effort from that point onwards to try and further that section try and embrace um, you know suppliers and the technical experts um, you know much like yourselves Mm. and and, and the industry bodies that are looking after things and uh, and and we feel like we've done that over over a period of time so yeah in terms of themes and stuff going forward but it's generally based on reader feedback um, uh, uh, you know which I I think is the best type of way to shape your content um, but also getting out and having the opportunity to talk to the likes of yourselves and the, the other big brands that we yeah. have in the company and a lot of the technical issues that their technical teams are facing the questions these are all things that we feel we can uh, you know produce in the magazine and talk to people kind of on, on, on you know from an independent yeah. source and, and get that information out there so yeah hopefully that answers the question are there any other challenges of putting a publication together that perhaps readers may not realize because you know we're, we're all reading the magazine we're going through it yeah but then there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes putting a good publication together is yeah there, is definitely. there anything else at all that perhaps um, that get the work goes into putting that together that, that yeah. people may not realise. Yeah, I think the most significant challenges are, and I think when you when you make the decision to kind of do what we did and and try and broaden the technical content in the publication, you know, the accuracy of the technical articles for us is it, it, you know is, is really really important and yeah. a significant challenge. Um, again, there'll be readers that are sort of listening to the podcast today. We, we, you know, the court on camera section in PE, I, I found that immediately after moving on to the magazine is the most popular section in okay, the publication. Yeah. But we've we, you no, we have printed the odd picture in error uh, where there, oh, it wasn't okay. a bodge job. And uh, the one thing I'll always say about that is I know when I've made a mistake in the publication because the emails st- soon start to come through from the readers <laughs> and it's time to put the tin okay. hat on. But yeah. I think, um, you know, I look at a situation like that and you always just have to learn from every mistake that you do. And I, I think the one thing that we always want to make sure, especially when we're putting technical content in particular into the publication, is its accuracy. Mm. So that is a challenge for us on a monthly basis to make sure that that content is accurate. Um, there's no mistakes because, you know, essentially, we, you know, we, we, we're producing that uh, what we hope will be an accurate resource for readers mm-hmm. so that that's a, a particular challenge for us um, we'll go on again to digital because that's created a hell of a lot of challenges yeah. uh, for a traditional print journalist and traditional print well, publications well, let, in particular let's get on to digital then because I was going to ask because yeah. obviously there's you know it, not just in our industry mm-hmm. but in every single industry there's a massive rise in digitalization uh, but for a printed publication what are the opportunities as well as the challenges of of digital because you hear you know throughout the years you always hear people say that perhaps a digital is going to kill off a printed version of the world but we're not yeah. seeing that at all no print is continuing yeah so what kind of uh, what are the the, the the opportunities and the challenges that a digital world is bringing to a trade publication well if i look at like what we're doing today 
is a classic example of one of the things that is actually given. The, you know, we would very, very rarely be given the opportunity to sit this side of the camera, mm. so to speak, and actually, you know, talk about our publication and talk about the way things work. And you know, we couldn't, we wouldn't necessarily print an article in our own publication about yeah, that sort of yeah. thing. So, you know, from a, from a magazine's perspective, um, we have um, you know a much better opportunity to raise our profile. So, obviously, we, you know, we're, look, we're looking at the social media channels to engage with your audience, to get feedback from your audience, which is an incredible important thing yep. for a print journalist um, even though you know at times some of that might not be feedback you like uh, some of it might be good at times um, but again it's feedback nonetheless um, on a printed publication to actually stimulate someone to correspond with you um, but again it's interesting I'll go back maybe and, and you can have a peek behind the curtain of the way the whole process has changed over a period of time when I first started at Hamerville in the early 2000s when I first came in and you, you probably won't believe this but we we on all of the publications that we've got at the company we, we, we would rely on a copy typist so okay, yeah. uh, let's say you've got a marketing professional like yourself or, or someone else working in a different you know that, that wants to contribute some copy or, or some new product information or anything like that to us it would be sent to us on hard copy in the post we would then have to get the red pen out sub that on a hard copy piece of paper <laughs> okay, okay. then then send it up to a copy typist who was responsible for for copying or typing up all of that content that us journalists had provided to that individual, which was hundreds and hundreds of different pieces yep. with individual subbing marks on as well. <laughs> so that person's then got to kind of second guess what it is that you're correcting. And then um, you would also then, someone in your position, if you were sending out some press releases or yep. something like that content to us, would have to send the pictures over by hard copy as well. So they would come in the post in a separate envelope and that would go up to a scanner so a physical scanner, and he would scan that in and create it into a JPEG or a TIFF for us, which would then allow a designer. So this would all sit on a central server, and a designer, a, a magazine with designer would go in and get it when it's your your time of the month to have your magazine designed. And that was the process we went through. No emails, no subbing of copy in Word documents or anything like that. So just over the last 10, 15 years, it's hard to even yeah. fathom that that would have been the process Yeah, it's hard before. to think that, that you would um, do anything else than that. Now. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, and this was, like I said, this was in the early 2000s when email was around and that kind of stuff. So, so the world for a traditional print journalist has changed yeah. quite exponentially. Um, you know, like I said, I, I'm not going to give my age away too much on this one. I probably feel like I'm in a fairly fortunate position, although I was still using an old Nokia phone up to about three or four years ago. But I just think over the last little while, you know, it, there's no doubt that digital and digital concepts are here to stay. Digital yep. platforms are here to stay. There's lots of people that like to consume their media and their information through those sorts of mm. channels. And I think rather than being scared of digital, which, which does sound like a cliche, any publication has just got to embrace the opportunities yep. that it, it creates for you. And I think, again, you know, I don't want to hark back to this reader survey that we do, but we, we know that the, the habits of the people that read the publication are they still visit a wholesaler on a daily basis or a weekly basis, mm -hmm. if not a daily basis or every other day. It's still a very traditional um, you know, ordering process and buying yeah. process, and, and 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 the guys and girls do like to pick something up and have something yeah. in the van that they can dip in and out of. And you know, there's been some very interesting, um, you know, information put out there. I think it was you know the Times or the Guardian a little while ago were, were put out a, a, you know quite some quite interesting research into the um, consumption of their their digital products mm. and their their printed products. And although you know digital is kind of uh, it's gaining popularity hugely mm. for them. One point they do make is that, you know, when a, a copy of their, their newspaper goes out on a digital format, they probably can guarantee that about 10% of the content in that digital product is going to be read and consumed, mm. whereas about 95% of the actual printed content yeah, of someone yeah, yeah. that's physically gone and printed up will be consumed over the lifetime of the person having that. Yeah. that but, you know, a newspaper, you put it down, you pick it up. I think the thing with digital sometimes is you you know you can be distracted by other things if you're if you're looking at something with digital and engaging yeah. through digital. So there are lots of different challenges. And I think also you know the one big challenge for the challenge for us as well is you know what content to use in the printed magazine. Do you do something online first? Do you yeah. do it in the print? So that creates other challenges as well. Um, it creates other opportunities as well at the same time. So so and I think just the instantaneous way that people like to consume their media these days. You know if you're not the first outlet to get a story up, then someone else is going to get it up you would on, yeah. a, on a printed monthly publication the world knew there was stuff going on outside of what you printed mm. in your printed monthly mag but they didn't know as much as what they do they didn't have anywhere near as many resources or platforms mm. or you know social media available where people are communicating so so it does create a significant amount of challenges in terms of the amount of content yeah. you've got to get out and 
um, you know, the way we work. And I guess <laughs> you, you hinted on it before that I guess the opportunity with digital that you have is that you can still have content fresh yeah. on the day, yeah. it, it, even though the uh, opinions might change throughout the weeks when the publication's out. There's, yeah. there's an opportunity there to keep stuff fresh yeah absolutely the for the readers yeah definitely and i i think um you know again you're never constrained online in terms of i i think you've you've always got to be mindful when you're producing content for a website um again whether the length of it how long someone's going to stay engaged with it but at the end of the day you're not actually constrained in terms of you've got a really good technical article that might be a thousand words for example and every bit of content is relevant there's no space constraints when you're producing something online mm, it's on yeah. a web page and someone can dip in and out of it so um so you know I, 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 there are you know there's a lot of benefits that do come with it the other thing is you can embed video content into yeah. web content um you know some really good supporting resources you can send someone off to a supporting website you can think, really expand what you yeah do basically. yeah and i think yeah. you also have to look you know again we always have to be honest with the people that are listening to the podcast as well and the readers of the magazine is you know ourselves and the other publications that serve the electrical trade it's not just pe you know there are other independent publications out there for us to be able to make our resources free and our publications free is that they need to be commercially supported yeah. in some sort of way and i think again you know digital and print are you know slightly different animals in terms mm. of the ways that you can monitor engagement and you know when we're talking to to our advertisers now there might be times where you know digital is a much more prevalent platform that they may want to communicate messages through and then there, you know the, the, there might be times where the print is is much more prevalent i think you have different methods of communicating with people through those you know different ways if you're trying trying to stimulate you know page hits or, yeah. or, or engagement through online you'll, you'll 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 have different challenges with that so so um so so yeah no it's, it's it's a really interesting piece and i think for us the strategy you know certainly over the last two to three years uh, really has been let's really really embrace digital it's not a threat at all print is still the bread and butter of our mm. business and still the bread and butter of what pe does but you know th- th- there's so many things that we're useful resources that we can we can help our readers to make you know make use of and and, and we just want really them to consume their content in whichever way they see you mm. know it, it is best for them if you're a younger generation and you prefer to do things through your smartphone and your iphone all the time yeah. then you know hopefully we can we've got you know platforms and and, and things that, that, that that cater to those guys as well in terms of our industry then what is there anything you're excited about that might be coming up in the future that you that perhaps the readers might be excited or just yeah. yourself in general that the kind of the trends are coming up yeah no i think one or two that if, I, if i'll give you a bit of an insight again into one or two key themes that we're going to look at over the next little while um m- mental so I, i'll talk about a more serious subject really mm. mental health is yeah. something that we haven't covered enough in the publication so far uh, in my opinion um and we're going to be doing a lot more on this okay. year. Obviously, it's been in the news quite a lot recently, but um, there are, you know, obviously hundreds of thousands of cases of people that are kind of suffering in in silence mm. um, with mental health issues, uh, and it, it is going to be a real focus of the publication. And again, for us to be able to highlight some of the issues that are going on with people, you know, we do need engagement, and we do need people mm. to be brave and come forward. Unfortunately, we've had two two chaps in particular over the last little while who've been incredibly brave with mm. some of the information that they've showed us and we're going to be publishing something in the, okay. in the next issue of the magazine which which will, will be quite uncomfortable reading I think mm. for some people but I think uh, we just really want to um, get know, that message empower out there, yeah. and get that message out and I think we have an important role as a platform within this industry to, to, to highlight those sorts of things again I think I'm chuckling on quite a lot, but uh, I, I think uh, you know your role as a publication, or the role as the publication, mm-hmm. as, as as I see it, 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 it is to be representative yeah. of our readers. We're co- called professional electrician and installer, and no, I'm not a professionally trained electrician and installer myself. This is for our readers. This publication, I, yeah. I, I think we never n- need to lose sight of that. So. Mental health is a serious issue that is challenging, you know, a lot of people now. So that's something we're going to cover. EV charging is a big buzz thing. Yep. So, you know, prior to us coming on to the air with, with this podcast, me and you were talking about some of the themes that we think are going to be prevalent over the next little while. And I think it's quite interesting, really. 18th edition has consumed an awful lot of our, our, our kind of content mm-hmm. over the last little while. And I'll make no apologies for that at all. I think, you know, and we've had some good feedback from readers about them saying how, how it's really helped them to yep. prepare for the changes that were going on. Um, I still think there's probably... A another year to 18 months of education needed as far as some of the amendments and what they need uh, mean for electricians on that side of things ev charging is going to be a fantastic opportunity uh, for the guys you know we know the government's committing to some pretty crazy schedules really in terms of infrastructures 
um, you know, uh, global commitments in terms of you know our carbon footprints and things yeah. like that. And of um, course, uh, uh, petrol cars and diesel cars. Yeah, you know, well, it's got the end of the sale in twenty thirty five. Yes. Is the age yeah, limit. I mean, uh, you know, again, I'm not gonna. I, and I always think with this sort of thing is, you know, you have to embrace the opportunity as it exists now. And I would always say to to, to again, the you know, the the, the 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 guys and girls that are listening to this podcast, there's a fantastic opportunity there out for you guys because for us to get that infrastructure in place we are going to need properly trained professionals that are doing these installations so you have a a fantastic opportunity um, to embrace that particular side of the market and we'll be doing a lot more education on how you can get into that Mm. there was a change in the recent amendment to the 18th edition which we're doing a lot of education on so EV charging is a big point smart technology always comes up obviously the smart home um, (coughs) again (coughs) it's interesting we've been talking about it a lot in the publication over the last little while but there's still you know, probably a lot of myths that still exist out there in terms of how difficult it is to become a, you know, uh, as someone that can uh, fit smart uh, systems into a customer's house. But I believe probably the way the government is going to go and the way organisations are going moving forward is that they will want as much connectivity yeah. as possible in people's homes or in commercial businesses because a they will want to, want to monitor energy usage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and what's going on with things. B, they'll probably want to control it after a while as well. And to be able to control mm. it, they'll need to monitor it. So I get, you know, I've got the feeling that, you know, or, you know, we, we, we certainly do as a magazine, we feel that smart technology is still going to be a big, big area for the guys going forward. I think there might be some reform within our own industry moving mm. forward. So again, I, I'm not going to go into um, the ins and outs of that particular subject area. So maybe that's a conversation for another podcast. But we do get an awful lot of correspondence and have an awful lot of conversations from, from guys that are, you know, not necessarily always happy about some of the practices that are going on in the industry at the okay, moment or, yeah. or feel that improvement is needed, yeah, really, okay. um, which is you walk into any sector or any industry and obviously, you know, we're closed off in this one and, and, and the guys and girls that are again reading the magazine, listening to this podcast, you probably think that these issues all just exist in the electrical industry. They don't. No, they exist yeah. in all trades and, and, and from a governmental perspective, um, you know, it must be incredibly difficult to administer uh, and police every single different trade that there is out there. But at the end of the day, um, you know, by hook or by crook, they've got to, you know, it's got to be done, um, mm. especially for electricians, you know, that are, that are going into a domestic property. And, you know, in, in a lot of cases, the work can be hidden away, so not always visible to, to the, to, you know, the end user. Um there's got to be that trust that the person going in yeah. is competent and qualified uh, to do that work correctly. So, um, so I think we might see some reform in the future, which I'm really excited about, yeah. and I hope that PE might be able to influence a little bit in that way. I just think that, that there's so many different things, and uh, again, um, when I have a new, I had a new star to start with me on the magazine a couple of weeks ago, so an extra bit of help with some editor- uh, yeah. from an editorial perspective. Whenever I talked about a new start of in, in in the publication to try to get them to understand the electrical industry, if certainly if they haven't come from it or don't know anyone in it, and the opportunities that might be out there, we generally talk about things that are of interest to them in their life. You know, um, might be the you know the, the football coming up in the summer or um, the EV charging infrastructure yep. or anything like that. And you know, the one prevalent we we, we were talking about the number of cameras in China, for example, right, okay. uh, and, and number and, and facial recognition and whether mm. that sort of technology might come over here. Um, you know, and, and and the one thing that it always comes back to, and when you ask the question is, but you know, there'll always be one certain type of indi- individual that's still going to be employed by these. So you know, you need professionals to fit these cameras. Yeah, yeah. you need all of these yeah. guys to so, say, you know, we need we need professionals for the EV. So one thing that excites me is that electricians, you know, and this trade, I always think they're going to be, you know, employed and and, and relevant. Um, which I think, again, if you work on a publication and you're looking forward to the future and everything like that, I think it's quite exciting, really. You know, um, and, and and no two months are ever the same in this industry yep. there's always a new story come out as well so you know again another thing that we're quite excited about is the announcement that you know the, the, the government is going to be looking at um, mandatory checks in the private rental sector okay, we've done a good. little bit about it in the magazine now how effective that process will be is actually going to be dictated by uh, how competent the electricians mm. are going in to do the work but it's still a very exciting step in terms of you know these checks have to be done yeah. on a mandatory basis that means that an electrician is going to be able to go in and inspect a property now from that perspective health and safety wise that can only be a good thing do you mm. know what i mean especially you know for for a tenant who again is, is renting that property you know based on um the trust that the mm. electrical equipment that's installed in there is safe um you know for them as a tenant and is that you've kind of hinted at it a lot <coughs> in that in that answer is the role would you say of a trade publication then is to go beyond the headline 
and look at the stories and the the detail for and against yeah. things. So you you've, you talked there about that the manager you checked, and you talked a lot about how that might affect our industry. Yeah. It's more, and you talked about it with the mental health. A lot of it is a sense of, right, here's the headline, yeah. this is what people are talking about, but this is... Now this is probably what you don't realise. Yeah. Or this is the other side of it. You think that's the answer, but this is the other side. Of yeah, the definitely. Argument. And I think that's the important thing. As the, that's the exciting thing. As a, you know, again, I alluded to a new lad we brought into the team. You know, one of his major responsibilities is going to actually, you know, spend the time doing the background research and looking for the meteor angles behind some of the topics that we're looking at. So, um, you know, again, I don't want to give too much away at this moment in time, but, you know, one of the things that we intend to do this year is to, to have a little look about how... Um, you know the electrical sector is governed in in different parts of the world uh, Mm. and the bodies that are operating that and if there are some um, you know uh, principles and elements of the way that's controlled that would resonate quite well over here and would work well over here and I think just having the time and uh, but 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 absolutely 100% you know we've we've got a responsibility really not just to pedal out things that are being sent into us and uh, you know as fact as well um, is to is to actually interrogate behind that and I think <clears throat> on behalf of our readers is to look at the things that you know the story from the, the, the their interest perspective not the person you know who, you know it might be a company's bought out a fantastic new product or something like that or, or, the, or they're, they're pushing for legislation or something like that but we've got to look at it from our readers perspective mm-hmm. how's it going to affect them moving forward and I think that's the most important thing and that, like I said I think going forward the the, the beauty of, of being in the role that we are is, is, is to be able to influence um, and you know again hopefully some of the things that we're doing with the publication and some of the events we're getting out to and, and, and meeting people and building relationships is allowing me and us to be part of kind of the bigger meteor conversations and you know and, uh, again we have a we have a uh, you know a, a responsibility almost on behalf of our readers to to be put in their view of things forward mm. they, they're, they're not always in such a luxurious position to be in some of these meetings and to have conversations yeah. with some of the people that we do so um so yeah no so so, so we definitely do we, we we do have that responsibility yeah. uh, final question then if yeah. people are listening uh are, are looking to perhaps get into writing perhaps they're, they've started to blog <laughs> or they're thinking about blogging or writing like um uh, their about their experiences in the industry or they feel like they've got a lot of technical information and they uh, they want to write about it and they want to get into perhaps publications in the future like professional electrician or other publications yeah. in the trade or start their own kind of writing uh, sphere what advice would you give to those people to to get them started yeah i mean uh, my 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 advice would always be um well done for thinking about it anyway yeah. so that's really good in the first place uh, and i think it's just a case of slowly build yourself up so the most important thing um you know if you want to get into this and i i, I think you know again i'm sat here as a a trained journalist not necessarily a trained electrician um i think you know if you are someone listening to the podcast who's out in the market and and you know um you, you know you you you've you've worked in this sector for a long time but you enjoy writing and you enjoy communicating you know there's a real good opportunity for you to get some content out there now you know the 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 first fundamental thing is articulate yourself properly so so again if it's writing a blog or whether it's putting stuff out on social media or anything like that read it back and look at it from the person that's going to be reading its perspective not your perspective from the person who's written it but the person who's reading it does it make sense have you articulated yourself properly that's the first fundamental thing because i think if people start to see things that's got you know, even grammatical or spelling mistakes here and that kind of stuff, they can soon switch off, even if you're writing yeah. a, a, a blog. Certainly in terms of the type of content that you're putting out on these blogs and, and that kind of stuff, you know, it, it is about articulating yourself and, 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 and ask questions. So don't always make statements. I think that they tend to be the ways that you can get good engagement back. So again, if you're putting a blog out, you know, you want, you want people to engage and come yeah. back. And normally, if it's an electrician that's done it, they, they want someone who's thinking like-mindedly to come back and say, oh, I agree with that or mm. I disagree with that. So, um, you know, ask questions of people. Don't make a statement and say it's this or it's that put the question back yeah. also to the person that might be reading it and then you can start to you know create some response and some d- debate around the subject but I think yeah anyone by all means absolutely 100% one of the things that we're looking to do more of in the publication that we've made a real concerted effort over the last little while is trying to get more reader based content into our publication so you see a lot of reader comments now where they've been sent through to us and a guy has kind of written a blog or, or you put his thoughts down on a piece of paper obviously we've had to tidy it up into, in, into maybe into our kind of magazine yeah. style um, but 
yeah, be proactive with sending out to publications like ourselves. We love hearing from readers and we love ideas. At the end of the day, again, you guys are on the front line, so you know the types of, the, of subject areas that, that people might find interesting, mm. things that you're finding as a challenge in your own job, which would be a really good thing. That's yeah. the other beauty of the electrical trade, in my opinion. Um, I've worked in other sectors before where if you if you ask readers to contribute to your publication or, 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 or you know, you want some engagement... There's been quite a lot of protection, is it? It's sort of, you know, so it can be quite protect. I don't want to share information with a fellow mechanic, for example, to okay. help him improve his business. Yeah. I find the electrical trade completely different, if I'm 100% honest. I, I, I think there's a really healthy... Um, a community? Yeah, sense, I do, yeah. I do. And, I, 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 you know, helping each other. I mean, by, by hook or by crook, the, you know, um, you have to be of a certain intelligence to work in this in this trade. As a, 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 you know, and, a, and obviously I think... I, I think a lot of uh, individuals realise that electricians sometimes do need help in their processes. It's best practice at times, you know, need, need, people need a little bit of help and yeah. reminders with that kind of stuff. Uh, and I find that electricians are great with sharing it with each other. I, it almost feels like a siege mob, mob mentality sometimes within the trade is that they, they you know, it, it, again, whatever views they have of, of the governance of the trade or anything like that, they will help each other yeah. uh, first and foremost because there's enough work to go around it doesn't need to be a protective industry there's so much work going around mm. we haven't got enough probably qualified or competent electricians for all of the work that needs doing around the country mm. um, so so yeah so I find that I find that really good so yeah just be proactive come up with good ideas yeah. think about something that someone else isn't doing as well so maybe take a slightly di- I always like reading stuff like a niche just a were. different take yeah. on, on you know some of my favourite kind of sports journalists for example that I, I read about are always the ones that actually have tried to take a slightly different angle Mm. to just the, the you know the the, the kind of um, sterile uh, you know obvious angle that yeah. everyone else is taking try and find a different angle try and think about something different so yeah definitely if you if you've got uh, you know a bit of a flair for writing and you like putting your thoughts down just going back to the mental health side of things mm. as well can be really helpful just to yeah. sit down and write stuff you know you don't know who else life. is going to benefit from of course you don't just reading that of course you don't and i think you know again it, uh, uh, if you're someone that's that's you know thinking about sitting down and putting something together uh, whether it's about your own experiences or whether it's to help other electricians just remember you're always doing it you know it's, you're always doing a good service yeah. uh, to each other so yeah definitely definitely don't detract yourself. There are courses that you can go out and do um if you if if you kind of want to get into the writing side of things but my my, my first you know, thought would be possibly get your own website or, or or set up your own blog feed and start doing things like that, and then you know start pitching things out to to, to publications like ourselves or platforms that might want to put that mm. out, and you can start seeing what type of engagement you get to your work, and then you can kind of go from there. <laughs>